All right, we're in uh, right at the end of First Timothy chapter three, and uh, let's see. We were looking at this last verse, verse sixteen, which actually has six Greek verbs in it that are all in the same voice and tense, and so it makes a it makes a rhythmic arrangement, kind of like a hymn, and. Uh, most of your modern translations uh, actually set it off like in a poem format um, where he says, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was, and actually, that's not the best uh, translation there because he's actually talking about Christ or and so most of the modern translations say he or who uh, was manifested in the flesh, justified or vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles or nations, uh, believed on in the world, received up in glory. And of course, uh, uh, that member of the Godhead who was manifested or revealed in the flesh would have been Christ. Uh, and again, keep in mind the context of 1 Timothy. And if you have the, sort of the uh, embryonic uh, or beginning uh, of this Gnostic heresy, they would have denied uh, that Christ possessed a fleshly, uh, flesh and blood nature. Uh, and then, of course, justified not in the sense of um, being set free from sin, but justified in the sense of of uh, proven correct, and so some translations use the word uh, vindicated, uh, proved to be right. I think the New American Standard, ESV, and others use the word vindicated. But even so, we even in modern day English, we sometimes use the word uh, justified in that sense. I was justified in uh, doing whatever I did, so that means I was correct. I was, I was right. Um, and then we talked about, uh, of course, we mentioned a little bit about what that means in the Spirit. Was that talking about Christ's personal Spirit or the Holy Spirit? Um, perhaps that doesn't matter too much, uh, but certainly uh, perhaps an allusion here to the resurrection. We know that Romans 1-4 says that Jesus was declared uh, to be the Son of God by what? Resurrection, right, the resurrection of the dead. And so uh, sometimes we don't talk about the resurrection perhaps as much as we should. I mean, because the, the fact of the matter is the resurrection of Christ is perhaps the most central tenet of Christianity. It is the one that the Christians of the first century clung to for their hope. I mean, uh, until Christ was raised from the dead, none of us had any hope for being raised from the dead. And certainly... Uh, that is still uh, our hope. And that is the hope that we need to give the world. That is the potential for being raised from the dead. And so death, the great enemy of man, was conquered by our Lord. And so the resurrection, uh, a very important part of Christian doctrine. And then I think we left off seen by angels. And that doesn't just mean he was, you know, they saw him or viewed him. But it has more to do with... Um, when the angels were around him or saw him, what was their response? I mean, you think about all the times in the New Testament that angels are referenced or mentioned with regard to Christ. Think about his birth, uh, the temptation, uh, Gethsemane, the tomb, the ascension, uh, going to Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, I mean, what what is the response? That's the key. What is the response of angels uh, to our Lord? It's always one of, of, uh, of uh, praise, worship, uh, and acknowledging who He is. And so, obviously, if angels do that, um, then what does that say for mankind? Sure, sure. Um, then it says he was preached among, and the New King James says the Gentiles, the ASV, the NASB, and the ESV, I'll say the nations. Um, and so basically this verse or this phrase then 
emphasizes the universality of the gospel, right? I mean, it's for everybody. Uh, for the whole creation, Mark 16 and 15, Matthew 28, go into all the nations, right? Um, all creation. I mean, Judaism was primarily national as far as its preparation for the Messiah. Uh, but once he came, his message of redemption was for everybody, right? So, preached among the nations. Believed on in the world. Uh, again, first he emphasizes the universality of the gospel message, then he emphasizes its success. And if you read the book of Acts, then you know that in the first century, the gospel had unbelievable success in as far as its response by the masses. Thousands upon thousands of people were converted. Um, and of course, we've talked about this before, but that word believe, especially when you go into the book of Acts, is a comprehensive term. It's not just talking about disposition or mental assent, but it's talking about what? What, it is all, what, it, what does it also embrace? If I say you're a believer, what am I saying? And I just, oh, well, okay. I, yeah, I accept it. Yeah, it also includes obedience. If I'm a believer, that means I've done those things that the Lord has asked me to do. So, um, uh, I remember one time I asked a fellow, some group was raising money, or they wanted Bibles that they were going to send to Russia, um, or something. So I was asking about it, which was fine. I mean, I... Give a Bible to anybody. You might be able to. In fact, if you're not a Christian, you probably need one worse than if you are. Um, but I was just asking him, I said, Well, who are you giving these to? I mean, how are they getting distributed? And uh, I do think it makes a difference, though, as to who's distributed. So, so that, that was really more of my question. I mean, who are you getting these into the hands of? And he said, Well, uh, I said, Are you, I mean, are these going to the churches over there, Christians, you know, or are they going to be the ones to get them? Well, he said, well, I can't say that. I said, he said that, you know, we're going to, they are going to get into the hands of believers. Well, that, that, that wasn't what I, he wasn't using that term in the biblical way. What he meant was, these are people that, yes, they've made some conscious or mental choice that maybe Jesus is Christ or he's the Lord, but they've not necessarily obeyed the gospel. And so that wasn't what I was asking. He wasn't using the term uh, in the same way the Bible uses the term. Uh, but the Bible uses the term believers in the sense that you know, of those that have obeyed. And then finally, the climax is received up in glory, which is obviously a reference to what? Yeah, his ascension. And of course, as you go through this list, obviously this is not chronological. It's thematic because if it was chronological, this last one would be uh, about four, right? It would come before preached among the nations. But it is climactic. And so he was received up. It is a fitting climax to the greatest drama of human redemption in history. And of course, received up is a passive voice, uh, meaning God took him back and of course exalted him uh, on high. Look at, um, let's go over to Luke. Let's look at a couple of chapters, a couple of references. Luke 24. You notice at the end of the book, actually go back. Let's not even go to the ascension. Go to verse 26. What happened when he's received up? That's really the point I want to make. Yeah, look at verse 26. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? The point I'm trying to make is when we talk about him being received up to the Father, he was exalted. Um, that was his exaltation. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. So it's not just that he went back. When he went back, 
he was placed in this position of exaltation and glory and authority. And of course rules over his kingdom. Being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the promise the Father of the Holy Spirit. Um, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then, I guess, another good passage to go along with that would be, uh, what, Philippians chapter 2. Let's turn over there. Get my pages to turn. You know, let this mind, verse 5, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, he didn't consider being God uh, in something to be held on to at all cost, made himself of no reputation, took the form of a slave. Being found in appearance or fashion as a man, he humbled himself, came to be and pointed to death, even the death of the cross. Now there's, here what's the point. Therefore, God also has highly exalted, given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, you know, when we talk about His ascension, it's not just, oh, He just he, he just went back to heaven. There's a lot more to it than that. He's exalted to the right hand of the Father. And Jesus said, He's given me all authority in heaven and in earth. He's ruling from His throne in His glory. And it is to Him that we will all answer, of course, one day, in fact, uh, Paul said the resurrection is uh, proof that God has set a day in which he will judge the world by that man. He will be sitting on the judgment throne. And so he is the one to whom we must answer. Uh, and so he has been exalted. So let's move into chapter 4, keeping in mind, of course, there weren't any chapter breaks uh, when this letter was written and so you need to keep that in mind of course as we keep the context together but chapter 4 of course is known for this great apostasy that's mentioned uh, and that's coming Paul says to Timothy uh, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, or later times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving or seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Devils is not a good translation there. There's only one devil. Okay. When you see the word devils in the King James translation, that's not a good translation. It should be demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods. Also, when you see the word meat in the King James Version, he's not talking about steak and chicken and pork. That's an old English term for food in general. That's like be vegetables or anything. From foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, in this context, if you're thinking about Judaism, it could have been meat. But not necessarily. I'm we'll talking about that. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused or rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So there's this ominous cloud on the horizon of this apostasy from the original faith. Uh, and in fact, in some sense, it had already. Uh, the spirit of it had already begun. Go turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look uh, at the beginning of yeah, that chapter. And of course, what was the second? What was the Thessalonians problem? Yeah, I mean, in, in Paul's emphasis to them, I guess, in preaching that you need to be ready 
for the second coming of Christ, they, they kind of uh, assumed, if you will, that it's coming soon. Now, yes, everyone should live as if he can come, because he can come, could come, uh, any minute. But you can't live that way if it means you're going to quit your job, move to the Ozarks and somewhere in Arkansas, uh, hold up in a log cabin with uh, a lot of water and extra food, and uh, you know, just wait. You can't you can't live life like that, which was kind of what the Thessalonians were doing. And so, um, I mean, you've got to go about life every day as if there's going to be another day. But live it as if it might be the last day, spiritually speaking. So, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, talking about the last day, the judgment day, will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or is worshiped so he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you remember? Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, and that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of law, now notice, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Well, there's a lot of questions about and then the law of one will be revealed. There's a lot of questions about what that restraining power is. I mean, one good explanation I've heard is that the restraining power was the Roman authority, the government, because until they quit persecuting Christianity and accepted some form of it, you know, by the time of Constantine and after, at that point it allowed who to come fully, what to fully develop. What was allowed to fully develop once this restraining power? Yeah, the Catholic Church. And so, um, but you may have some other ideas on that. But nevertheless, getting back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, we've got this coming defection. Notice the Spirit speaks or expressly says. And so that's one of the this is one of the biblical texts we use to show that the Spirit is what as opposed to what. He and I Yes, absolutely. He's not a force like Star Wars or even some cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses would claim. Um, but he is a person, a personality. He speaks. And of course, the fact that he's speaking also says that the apostolic message is not self generated. Paul didn't, Paul didn't come up with this. It came straight from God, from the Spirit. And of course, this word expressly means, uh, that Greek term means basically explicitly or plainly. In fact, I think. Some of the modern versions, I know the New American Standard says explicitly. The Spirit says, the Spirit says explicitly or plainly that there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be a departure from the faith. And of course, the time frame here is when. When's, what's the time frame? When's it going to happen? Yeah, in the latter times, the la later times, the last days. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 3.1. I think it uses that terminology. Um, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, when were the last days? Yeah, they started on Pentecost. And so they've been going on for quite some time because this is the last dispensation. Christ is ruling. There will be. And if we reject Him, then we reject our only hope of salvation. There's not going to be any other plans to be saved. And so this apostasy, obviously, apostasy is always 
just like this one, even in our day, it doesn't matter. Whenever there's apostasy, it's always progressive, right? I mean, nobody got up one morning in the first century church and said, hey, I got ideas for the Catholic Church, and let's just, you know, let's just totally change it. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's, it's a progression, just like when churches go astray today. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. But it happens over time. And they, there will be a departure. But even when there's a departure, there's always going to be one. Even if you even if it's not recorded in secular history, even when there's a departure from the faith, there's always going to be one. Yeah, there's always going to be a remnant. There's always going to be a faithful remnant. Um, and so, you know, sometimes things can get depressing when there's a big departure. But there's always going to be a remnant. Depart from the faith or fall away signifies to distance oneself from. Uh, and what are they departing from? What does it say? The faith. I was reading A.T. Robertson, the great Baptist scholar. He didn't even get it here. I mean, they just don't understand the way this term is used with a definite article. But it is the gospel system, the Christian system, Jesus Christ and his body of teaching. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to reinforce what you said, uh, uh, Greg, about the progression. I like to use the term things metastasize. And it happened so easily. I was just thinking about what Pearl obeyed the gospel in 1962, that congregation, Jacksonville, North Carolina. And the last time that we were there to attend would have been when our mother passed away, which is some 60 miles to the, to the uh, south of that. But we went there for a man worship service. And uh, we had to leave because you can see the metastasized metastasize from your life one way in there and there's something else. And I can remember in that same congregation where we would talk about certain things and then somebody invariably will ask, well, what's wrong with that, brother? And if you can't defend and you can't answer, you don't see anything wrong with it. They say, you know, it's metastasized to something else. Yeah. I mean, yeah it's amazing when you, uh, for those of you that have had that happen, you know, you maybe attended somewhere years past, or have been there before, and, and maybe many years go by, and then you go back, and, you know, it's a totally, totally different place. I remember, yeah, I told the story about the woman. Uh, <coughs> I want to say the old woman, but I, <laughs> uh, but I told you the one about where I was looking for the woman that was singing in the audience. You remember the story I told you about the church where we went to? We were on a volleyball trip in Little Rock. And we went to this big church down there. <coughs> well, when I was at 30 years ago, when I was in college, boy, that, they would sing the praises of this church. The great Sixth and Israel Church, Little Rock, Arkansas. Well, I didn't realize it when we went there for church that Sunday, but that was the 6th and Israel Church. They changed their name to the Central Church of Christ. In fact, Leon Barnes used to be out here at Germantown. <laughs> and so we go in and uh, worship, and they've got uh, these uh, guys leading, singing praise guys on the stage, two or three of them, <laughs> which was fine. I mean, I... I, I don't I don't get as bent out of shape as quick as some people because I try to analyze things from the scriptures. And frankly, if you can offer up one guy to stand up here and sing, I don't know why you can't have three, as long as we're all singing. But um, I think it's probably not uh, orderly. You know, putting things decently and in order. And obviously the attitude's probably wrong because they're probably doing it for a show. I mean it's all about your purpose. Anyway. But nevertheless, I'm sitting there and I keep hearing this woman's voice over everybody. But she wasn't on the stage. And it was really confusing me and throwing me off. So my 
family got tickled at me because I'm spending up my worship. I'm going to find this one. Um, became a quest. Well, I found her finally. This old, I, I thought this would have been a young person, but this was an older lady sitting on about the second row with her husband, and she had her own microphone. Yeah. Okay. So, in their minds, I guess, technically speaking, they felt like because she wasn't standing up here, and they could just hand her a microphone in the audience, that somehow that didn't make her leading the worship service. My point is, not to get into all that again, but my point is, is that that church was this great church I've heard about many years before. And what a great you know, boy, uh, influence for good in Little Rock, Arkansas. Right? And I'm, I, I, over time, things can change. And it doesn't take, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't take all that long. You got the same thing in this city. Uh, except it's a man's voice with the bass somewhere with the mic. Right. Well, why did these people fall away? Why? He tells you. They were seduced. They yielded to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, these are not uh, actual demons. And they're not even ghosts. What does he mean when he says deceiving spirits? Who are these deceiving spirits? Turn over to 1 John chapter 4. It'd be the same thing today. Could you be lured away by a deceiving spirit? Sure you could. And I'm not talking about somebody speaking in your ear, whispering to you while you're laying in your bed at night. That you can't see. Absolutely. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every what? spirit, but test them whether they are of God. Because, now here's the definition of these spirits. Because many, this, this, this is parallelism. Because many what? False prophets have gone out into the world. When he calls these people seducing spirits, they're just false teachers. They're, they're, they're listening to false teachers. And so, uh, they are giving heed, turning their attention to these false teachers. And then he talks about the doctrines of demons. And that's kind of a controversial phrase. There's some people that think that that's actually doctrines taught by demons. I kind of doubt that. There is no evidence. If you read your, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, you won't see any evidence of demons going around teaching their own doctrine, do you? In fact, when the demons did say anything, they generally did what? They acknowledged the truth. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't go around teaching false doctrine. Why? Why did they not go around teaching false doctrine? Because more than likely, demons were who? Based on what we know. Probably the departed spirits of the wicked dead who had been allowed to come back and inhabit. Remember how that guy liked to hang around the tombs? His own body might have been in that tomb. But they were allowed to inhabit people for a brief period of time so that Christ could demonstrate His power over the spirit realm, the unseen realm. And they knew who He was. They, they had already been, they were already being punished. In fact, those that went into the swine said, please, Jesus, don't send us back into the what? Don't send me back into the abyss. Don't send me back into Tartarus, the Hadean realm. I don't want to go back there. Just send me in those send me into those pigs. The problem is pigs aren't made to inhabit human. I mean, they, they weren't designed for humans to inhabit their bodies. I mean, the pigs couldn't take it. So a pig brain won't take a human spirit. And so what they do? They ran down the bank, drowned. So 
I doubt these are demons that are teaching anything. More than likely then, just grammatically speaking, I would probably read this as to say, when you say doctrines of demons, they're doctrines regarding demons. There's several scholars that have written upon about this concept of demons in the ancient world, and they were perceived as the spirits of certain dead people. And the Greeks would actually bestow deity upon them, worship them, attempt to contact them through mediators. Do people try that today? Paul referred to the pagan idolaters in Athens as worshipers of, quote, strange gods. That Greek phrase means literally foreign demons. So, the question then becomes, is there anything in this developing apostasy which is analogous to the concept of demons as far as the Greek world was concerned? Now think about it for a minute. Is there anything in Catholic doctrine that bears some resemblance to the Greeks' world's understanding of demons and the way they treated them, the way they worshipped them and attempted to contact them? What particular Catholic doctrine sounds very similar to that? No? Somebody say it? No. What about adoration of the saints? Saints become objects of worship, providers of mediation in Catholic doctrine. Eusebius, who lived from 263, talked about this to 339, this adoration of demons. And so that's why a lot of commentators and scholars believe today that this adoration of the saints is a development out of that particular belief. But the Greeks worship them. And frankly, Catholics worship saints, do they not? Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, you know, is different. When Paul was preaching false doctrine, teaching error, he did so how? How did he say he did it? No, but what else? Ignorance. Ignorance. So there is a difference between, between teaching error in ignorance and teaching error hypocritically. In other words, no sincerity. Deliberately distorting the truth, which is what these people were doing. These false teachers. This passage or this phrase, seared with a hot iron, is all one word in Greek. Literally means to mark by branding or to burn with a branding iron. Uh, we also get our English word, cauterized. Um, and so there's a couple different takes on this. Uh, some commentators believe that um, these false teachers, they've been captured by Satan, so they've actually been branded with a mark. You know, Paul was branded, he said, with the marks of who? Who was Paul branded with the marks of? Christ. He belonged to Christ. Because who got branded in the first century? People were, a lot of people were branded in the first century. Who got branded? Two, two groups of people. Slaves were one. Paul says, I've been branded with the marks of Christ. I'm a bondservant. I'm a doulos. I'm a slave of Christ. I bear in my body the marks of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So slaves were branded to show ownership. Who else was branded in the first century? Anybody? Criminals, yeah. Yeah, criminals, criminal, prisoners, criminals. So um, that's one view of the verse. But of course, the other is when you talk about having your conscience seared, cauterized, it could hint of a conscience that's what? If I say my conscience has been seared, cauterized, it means I'm what? That's exactly what I was looking for. Past feeling. Nothing affects me. The gospel doesn't affect me. Um, 
I can sit out here and I can listen to the truth over and over and over again, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And maybe I'm a Christian that needs to, to change the way I'm behaving or maybe start doing what I'm not doing. Or perhaps I'm, I'm not a Christian. I'm an alien sinner and I need to respond to the gospel. But my conscience is past feeling. Either way, either explanation of this verse, but either one of them's, well, I mean, they're both negative. And so what are some of the, what is one of the characteristics of these false teachers? They practice a particular brand of asceticism. What is asceticism? I use the word asceticism. And people do that today. What does it mean if I'm an ascetic? They deny themselves. Yes, absolutely. I, I, um, I'm going to deny myself certain physical um, pleasures or appetites in order to either prove or to help develop my spirituality. And the New Testament just simply does not teach that that's necessary. Um, but that's always been out there. And so, what are some forms of asceticism that we see here? They're going to forbid to marry. Well, how has that worked out? And how does that work out for groups that practice that? Yeah, I mean, every day we pick up a newspaper or see the news where there all this <coughs> abuse has been going on because these men have not been allowed a natural outlet for their desires and commanding to abstain from certain foods. <laughs> Josephus says that among the Jews, the Essenes had negative views regarding marriage because the, it generated domestic quarrels. And then when Gnosticism came into full bloom in the second century, there was further discouragement of marriage. Uh, there used to, there were in the second century groups of quote virgins that were associated with certain churches, and they would extol the celibate life. And then by the third century, celibacy was starting to be required by those taking quote holy orders, and obviously it became mandated in the Roman Catholic Church among its clergy, probably going back to the fourth century. Irenaeus talks about this abstaining from certain food near the end of the second century. Um, well, there were dietary restrictions under what? The Mosaic regime, right? Um, and it's interesting, and of course a lot of those, why it, it stressed the holy nature of God's people, a lot of those, frankly, now that we study them, were for their protection physically. Um, but because of that and because you had so many Jews that obeyed the gospel in the first century then you had some that couldn't quite get past that conscience issue Romans chapter 14 of eating you know meat certain forms of meat well that's okay Paul the Holy Spirit through Paul said look it's not a big deal what you want to eat or what you don't want to eat it's a matter of choice though that's the point Nobody has the right to demand from Christians that you don't eat certain things or that you eat certain things. It's a matter of private conscience. And in fact, Peter's up on that roof uh, before Cornelius' men came to get him. And God said, I've cleansed all these things. You, you can eat anything you want to. Um, but the Greek word for meats here is a generic term signifying food in general. And so it's not just meat, but abstaining from any kind of food. Or, and maybe even the idea here is imposing fasts on people. How many, how many required fasts were there under the law of Moses? Sometimes we think that the law of Moses had all these fasts. Everybody's fasting all the time. How many required fasts were there under the law of Moses? One. Just one. What day was that? Well, they're eating them Passover. <laughs> Get Passover lamb, you know. No, Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. Only 
day of fast under the old law. And so, uh, how many are demanded under the New Testament? None. Now, obviously, yeah, and Mark is thankful for that. Obviously, if you go into Acts 13, 2 Corinthians 11, and other places, optional fasting is acknowledged as having some value in certain circumstances. But, not required. I like what one commentator said. Some historians have observed that the further the church drifted from deeper spiritual values and inclined towards secularism and worldlyism, the more likely the tendency became to trust in externals like fasting and other such things. Follow what, he's, what they're saying? The more worldly the church became, the more secular it became, the less spiritual it was, then people started looking at physical ways to either show or affect their spirituality. Hence this abstaining from certain foods, the fasting, the to Mary, all this asceticism somehow is going to make me more spiritual. I'm going to get in touch with my spiritual self by doing that. Doing it in the basement of their parents' house, playing video. Yeah, he had family working on 